say good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to worship. Thank you for joining with us. And would you bow with us as we pray? Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for this great privilege to approach your throne of grace. We thank you, God, that you don't refer to us according to our sin. You don't treat us or reward us according to our iniquities. But your word declares, as far as the east is from the west, so have you removed our sin from us. Father, for that we are grateful. We can never repay you, but we tell you thank you. And so, Father, we pray for strength to represent you well with our whole life as a measure of worship unto a God who's worthy. Father, we pray that you bless and fill our time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And every heart said amen. Receive our praise to you. Amen, amen, amen. Anybody came to lift up the name of Jesus? I know we came to lift up the name of Jesus. And we came to come to sing his praises. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven.
praise team music ministry for reminding us that nobody is greater than our God. Man, that, that's refreshing in the face of things that would seek to debo us or bully us, uh, but to know that nobody is greater than our God. Come on, just look, look, look in the mirror, look at your neighbor, just, just, just help them to understand that nobody is greater than our God. Come on, tell them. Tell them. Yeah, no, nobody's greater than our God. Amen. Thank you for joining with us. We welcome you to the Mount Carmel Baptist Church where the Lord Jesus Christ reigns. Amen. That he is the head of the church. Amen. And we are uh, just pleased to be a part of the body and certainly want to do our part and seeing others uh, come to place faith in Jesus Christ and to strengthen those who are part of the body. Uh, would you pray with us as we begin uh, our time of uh, looking at the text? Certainly we've already begun worship. Amen. Amen. And Father, we thank you again uh, for this great privilege that you uh, give us that we get to look into uh, the law of liberty. Father, we pray that we would find freedom uh, and rest and liberation in your word. Father, bless our time, God. We pray that as we, as we teach, as we preach, uh, that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart, that they would be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer, less of me and more of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And every heart said amen. Amen, amen, and amen again. Uh, we uh, certainly appreciate every opportunity we get, uh, not only to look at God's Word, but to share God's Word. Um, it's one thing to read something, but then it's another thing to be able to read with understanding, and then it's also another thing to be able to read and have somebody to share with you or to explain uh, things that may not be uh, as clear. And so tonight we get the privilege to do that. We get to study God's Word together. Uh, man, how we miss uh, gathering together physically where we could exchange questions and comments. Um, and so uh, we continue to pray um, that the Lord would uh, just blow this COVID <laughs> somewhere else. Uh, and uh, someday we pray real soon uh, the words our president utters that it's just going to go away. Uh, we're praying that, that that really happens someday, sometime real soon, where we can really gather again and uh, sharpen one another uh, with the Word of God. On tonight, we continue uh, in our time together in the book of James. Uh, the last time we were together, uh, we stopped at James chapter 1, uh, verse 24. Uh, and there, uh, really verse 23 and 24 go together. Uh, so we'll just read it again so that we'll have context for where we begin tonight at verse 25. Uh, reading from the New American Standard Bible, the word reads this way, uh, beginning at verse 23 of the first chapter of James. It says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks uh, verse 25, I thought for uh, where we start tonight, but one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Uh, the last time we were together, I uh, helped us to understand that many times uh, when we look at the Word of God, depending on what version we have, uh, when it means humanity, uh, the pronoun there, uh, uh, or the term there, may be a masculine term, uh, but it's certainly not just for men, amen. And most of the time, you can tell by the context, if it's talking about spe something specifically for a man or something specifically uh, for women. Uh, and so uh, we understand that these are principles that we'll look at on tonight. These are uh, uh, principles found in God's Word that are applicable uh, to men, and to women. Amen. To boys and to girls. Amen. 
Amen. This is not just for, just for one sex or for one class of people, uh, but these uh, are good uh, for the people of God. Um, so where we left off on last week, it says that um, it's not good that a person simply hears the word, uh, but does not uh, do the word. Um, and then it gives us um, an example of someone who looks in the mirror and immediately forgets what they look like. Uh, that's really not good because, again, we said the mirror uh, really just shows us us. It really doesn't fix us. Amen. If there's crumbs on the side of our face, the mirror won't fix it, uh, but it'll point it out to us, and we'll have an opportunity to fix it. And so here, uh, James, again, is helping us to understand uh, that where our faith is, there should be visible signs. There should be some uh, visible, visible manifestations of what we believe. Uh, because believe it or not, what we believe shows up in our behavior and it shows up in our speech. And James helps us to understand that not simply uh, what we profess to believe uh, uh, is important, uh, but really what we believe by what we do is of the utmost importance. Uh, in this 25th verse, uh, James says, uh, but one who looks intently at the perfect law. And here we have to understand that uh, when James says uh, the perfect law or the law of liberty, he's still talking about the word. Uh, although he's using a different word, he's talking about the word. And in the texts uh, that show up uh, before uh, this 25th verse, we see that, man, there uh, are things simply found in the Word that are uh, blessings to us. As a matter of fact, in verse 21, uh, uh, James encourages believers to put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. And then he says, in humility, receive the Word, the Word of God and planted, which is able to save your souls. And so he, he's helping us to understand it's it's not simply good that we hear and not do. But he says, but the one who looks intently at the perfect law, at the Word of God, at the Bible, um, and, and uh, the Bible, uh, contrary to what many think, is not uh, designed to constrain us or cause us not to be able to enjoy life or have fun, uh, but it's meant to be a law of liberty. Uh, not because I say so, because the Bible says that about itself. And we know, uh, because the Bible testifies about itself, uh, that it is the inspired Word of God, that this is God-breathed. Amen. And many times when preachers preach and we're looking for it, amen, God's Word is, man, he doesn't, he doesn't even need an amen. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't need a motion. He doesn't need a second. Uh, he doesn't need a majority for it to carry. Uh, but God's Word stands all by itself. And so the Word says uh, that the Bible, the Word of God, is perfect. It's the law of liberty. And the person who, who, who looks intently or who, who, who studies the Word of God, who, who reads the Word of God for more than just trying to check it off, I did it today, but who, who really considers uh, what's in the Word of God and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. The Bible says this man will be blessed in what he does. As a matter of fact, uh, that's what uh, the psalmist says, I believe, in Psalm 1, or, uh, uh, where it talks about uh, uh, the blessed man loves the law of the Lord, and he meditates in it day and night. And so James here picks up on that. He said, yep, uh, this person who not only um, reads the word, but then becomes a doer of the word, uh, they will be blessed in what they do. And one of the wonderful things about reading God's word is it's more than just um, a code book. It's more than just rules and regulations. It's more than just do's and don'ts. And one of the things, one of the things that Jesus has helped us with is that uh, before Jesus comes, um, it's impossible for us to fulfill the law. Like, it's, it's, it's impossible for humanity to keep the law, but he comes and he fulfills the law, and then 
um, all of our righteousness now is not no longer tied to the old covenant because Christ has fulfilled that. And so that nobody will think that we should not live moral lives. James said, hey, listen, you don't need to just be a, re- a reader of God's word. You don't, you don't need to just hear God's word, but you need to be a doer. James says, and, and, and the Bible says that the just shall live by faith, but that does not mean that we disregard what God's word says. Amen. There, there, there are still parameters in which God expects those who love him and are part of his body uh, should behave and should comport ourselves. And it's not based on how we feel about certain things. It's based on what God's word says about it. However we feel about God's word, it, it, it makes no difference. Uh, people want to uh, debate others about what God's word says. Well, it may be of some good to debate others about what God's word says. But ultimately, if you land in a place where God is not, regardless, uh, if people watching the debate think you won, if you land somewhere where God is not, you've not won the debate. You really harmed yourself. You really uh, deceived yourself. It's really bad to be doing bad and think you're doing good. It, it, it's, it's really bad to think you're going in the right direction only to discover uh, when it's too late to turn around, uh, when, when you, only to discover that it's no more time left on the clock, that you, that you were going in the wrong direction and it's too late to course correct, it's too late to turn around. And so James says, uh, don't just hear the word, but do the word. But then he says, one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not by the norms of the day, not by what's trendy, not by what's popular, not by what's the new fad of the moment, but abides by God's holy word, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this individual will be blessed in what they do. Why will you be blessed in what you do? Because if you carry out God's word, it will never lead you astray. God's word would never lead us to sin. Matter of fact, James tells us that, that God never tempts us to sin. He, he never tempts us to do evil. So if we look intently at God's word and we abide by God's word, then What we do will be blessed because we'll be doing what God is blessing. Many times we want to call God into our situation. God, come bless this. Well, God said, I've I've already blessed some stuff. Just just work in the area I've already blessed and stop trying to carve these new lanes and say God is on my side. And the real question is, are you on God's side? Because God, he he doesn't move. He, He doesn't change his side doesn't change. He's always on the side of right. He's never on the side of wrong. He's never on the side of evil. So instead of us trying to uh, coax God to our side, we need to find out where he stands and get on his side. The text in verse 26 says, if anyone thinks himself or themselves to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Hmm. James is going hard after the believers. Man, he, he ain't pulling no punch. He said, if anyone thinks they're themselves to be religious, if, if, if anybody's going around bragging about how religious they are, about how big their Bible is, how great their faith is, but they do not control their tongue, they've deceived their own heart and their religion is really worthless. What, what they purport to have and what they purport to believe is really worthless for them. There are some people who may do some good stuff, may do some good work, but uh, the text says, if that individual doesn't bridle their tongue but deceives their own heart, their religion is worthless. In fact, the Bible says there will be people, when when the Lord comes back, they're going to say, I did this in your name, I did that in your name, and he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. 
There may be some people that can testify, say, yep, I was hungry, they fed me, I was naked, and they clothed me. Um, it won't be worthless for them because they'll feel better, but it'll be worthless for the one who did it because they'll get no credit for it. So James says, instead of thinking yourself to be religious, um, believing yourself to be religious, this is a test for you. Uh, check and see if you're able to control your tongue. Does everything that comes up come out? Hmm. Hmm. I don't care how, how young you are, how, how, how old you are, man, James is pulling no punches. Care how long you've been in church, if you sit in an office, if you, if you are in a position of leadership or authority, James says, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, that a person who does not bridle their tongue but deceive their own heart, their religion is worthless. Why, preacher? Because the mouth only speaks what comes and flows out of the heart. Yeah, yeah. Now, that, they ain't just say it. it. It came from somewhere. Mm-hmm. So James says, don't, don't have a worthless religion. Learn how to bridle your tongue. Learn how to control your tongue. And it's amazing uh, that the author here uses the word bridle, which we're uh, familiar with, is used with horses uh, this the little, the little piece they put in their mouth to control the direction uh, they go to, to cause them to stop or, 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 or to speed up. Or, uh, it, it's used to direct the horse, and it's really a small thing, but it directs where they go. And so James says the tongue is really a small thing, but it is really telling of something larger. What you say comes from a place in your heart. And if you think you're religious, uh, but you, you're not controlling your tongue, your, your tongue is untamed, uh, your religion is worthless. Verse 27, he says, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this. And, and it's good that, that, that he puts some qualifiers on there. Because there are some things that we would identify as pure and undefiled religion. But James says, hey, listen, this is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father. And this is it. To visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. In other words, um, this is pleasing and acceptable practices in the sight of our God and Father is to help those who are unable to help themselves, um, help those and care about those who cannot uh, return the favor to you. Visit orphans and widows in their distress, and then to keep yourself unstained by the world. In other words, we, 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 we've often heard it said that we're just pilgrims passing through. Um, we're not of the world, but we're certainly in the world. And so James is saying we need to be in the world, but not function like the world. In other words, James is saying we, we are in the world. We are having an earthly experience. We do live on earth. There are laws that we ought to abide by, but don't get caught up in the sin and anything that's contrary to what God's word uh, would call us to. He said, this, this, this is pure and undefiled religion. I've heard, I've heard Lisa Fields uh, say this. She is a, an apologist, uh, one who uh, really spends a lot of time uh, defending the faith and then providing resources uh, to defend in the faith. And uh, she had this, this to say. She said, man, it, there are so many people out there who can preach and teach the word well. Um, they, they stand and make great proclamations about the authority of Scripture, but then don't live like the Scripture is authoritative. James is saying, hey, listen, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. Don't, 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 don't make a great show trying to defend the faith and saying how authoritative the scriptures are, but then live like they have no authority over your life. James says that. 
Uh, that, that, that's not good. That, 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 that is not good. So, so we need to watch what we say, right? Because one, one, one could think that it's not important what I say, it's more important what I do. But James helps us to keep things uh, in a healthy balance. There's some healthy tension there. He talks about that what we believe ought to drive what we do. But then he says, what you say is important too. Because what you say comes from a, come, come from a real place. And so he says, pure and undefiled religion in God's sight. And that's really um, the one who will stand before. We won't, we won't stand before people we can see or others that we try to impress. We'll have to stand before God, the righteous judge, who won't call good bad and won't call bad good. He, he is the righteous judge, and he judges rightly. And uh, all of us want to hear him say, well done, uh, but if we've not done well, um, he, he won't lie. We shout about, you know, God's not a man that he should lie. When we stand before him, he, he ain't going to start lying then either. He, he's not. He, he's not going to do what some, sometimes happens at funerals. He, he's not going to paint a better picture than what is there. And so James helps us. He says, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit the orphans, to, to be concerned about uh, justice and righteousness, to, to be concerned about those who are on the margins, to be concerned about those who are overlooked and not looked at at all. Uh, James says, religion uh, that pleases God uh, looks after those kinds of individuals so that people aren't mistreated, so that people aren't uh, lacking unnecessarily. Good religion does something about it. Doesn't just say, I'll pray for you. When it's within our power to do something about it, just do something about it. And then, not simply uh, that, but then keeping ourselves unstained by the world. It's, it, it's real easy to get carried away and get lost with the crowd. That's why it's, man, this, this um, mob mentality, like it's a real thing. Like people get with a group of people uh, bent on doing something crazy, and you, you could be a really good person, but you got caught up in the mob, and you just as crazy as everybody else. James says, no, keep yourself unstained by the world. Don't, don't, don't follow the world's path. Follow Jesus, because the truth is uh, Christians, uh, those who... Uh, our followers of Christ, if we're following Christ, we'll never be following the world. Amen, lies. <laughs> if we're following Christ, we'll never be following the world. And if we're looking intently at the Word of God, the Word as we more than just hear it but do it won't ever lead us to look like the world, but will cause us to look less like the world and more like Jesus, the Son of God. James goes on into this second chapter of the book of James. Uh, and he says, uh, my, my brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. And somebody must look at them and say, well, what do you mean, James? And so he gives them an illustration. He says, for if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? James says, it is not good to hold your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism, which means racism has no place in the Lord's church. Amen, lights. I don't care how you can uh, break forth the word of life, uh, how, how clear your orthodoxy is, um, because evidently 
your orthopraxy is lacking something because your understanding of orthodoxy is off somewhere. As a matter of fact, that's what James just got finished telling us. Don't, don't just be a hearer of the word. Be a doer of the word. And then James says, in doing what the word requires, the word would never lead us to show favoritism. It would never cause us to be an unfair judge. It um, never causes us to uh, prefer the poor nor the rich, but to judge or to weigh a thing based on just measures. And the Bible says in the book of James, if anybody lacks wisdom, Ask God. And one real clear way for the Lord to answer you is to read his word. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to, man, there are so many things that are clear in God's word where we've been wondering, about, like, what is, what is God's thoughts on this? Open, open his book. Just, just open it. He, he, he has addressed so many things. And so the more we open God's word, the more we look intently at his perfect law, the law of liberty, uh, the better we'll be able to walk and um, be a better ambassador for our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, don't show partiality. Don't, don't, don't favor one person over the other and, and don't judge uh, worldly or wickedly. Don't, don't do that. The church has made a lot of errors in how we've judged some things and how we've shown partiality and how we've shown racism. Man, it, 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 it saddened me, man, that there are large chunks of the body of Christ that still struggle with being able to denounce racism. That instead of dealing with the sin and stain of racism, they want to attack other things. Like, no, just deal with racism. Um, uh, like some people have a problem with social justice. Well, if you don't like social judges, justice, just give them God's justice. J judge fairly. Don't, don't judge impartially. If you don't like social justice, treat people the way James suggests. If you have such a high view of Scripture, then act like it. <laughs> Don't just tell me you're cutting it straight, but, you, but you're not living like it. If the, world, if the Word is authoritative, then our lives ought to show it. Amen. Amen. Every now and then, what you believe it ought to show up. Matter of fact, more than every now and then, because that's been the problem. It shows up every now and then. You know, when it shows up on Sunday morning... <laughs> Right? Now, not, not every now and then, but it ought to show up often. And the more we look into God's Word, the more we'll be encouraged and directed to allow God's light to shine forth through us. Justice is not a new thing. God was concerned about justice. Jesus was concerned about justice. You can't look at God's Word and not come away with that God has something to say about justice. Even in the book of Leviticus, uh, God says something about not judging impartiality, not treating people unfairly. This is not a new concept, and it's not difficult. All this other stuff you want to point us to, man, that's some, that's some difficult stuff, like critical race theory. Can I just help some of my um, uh, really, really, really fair-skinned brothers and sisters? Um, critical race theory. It's not a textbook that black people need to understand that there's injustice in the world. We have a lived experience. And it's on record. It's a historical fact. Stop bending yourself into pretzels trying to justify wrong. Just confess it. And the Bible says that God is willing to forgive us of every wrong. Just repent and turn. Go the other way. If you have such a high value of Scripture, tell me which, which Scripture is it? Is it just John 3, 6, 8? Is that it? Is that all God? Surely God has said more than John 3, 16. He's also inspired the book of James, which says, okay, I, I see you with your high value of Scripture, but let me, let me help you. Don't just be a hearer. 
Um, be a doer. And if that's confusing, if you need an example of how you ought to do it, of how it ought to look in practice, don't show favoritism. Don't, don't be racist. Whatever your nationality is, God's saying don't judge unfairly. Verse 5, let me, let me, let me go back, uh, verse 3. Uh, the latter portion, and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit by my footstool. Verse 4, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Just in case you didn't know that this was evil, James helps you. Mm -hmm. J James helps you. Because sometimes people are like, you know, uh, <clears throat> there ain't a racist bone in my body. I'm, I'm, I'm really a good person. James says that if you do this, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? And in this question is an implied, yes, you have. So whether you think you've done evil or not, James helps us to understand that this is evil. Judging impartially is evil. God is not pleased with that. Preacher, how do you know? Verse 5 says, listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Now, we have to understand that James is writing to believers, uh, but primarily he's writing to Jewish believers. And we have to understand that God chose the children of Israel not because they were the brightest, not because they were the richest, not because they were the largest, but he chose them based on his own prerogative. They were smaller than other nations. They were poorer than other nations. But God chose the poor in the world that they would be rich. And so just in case the Jews couldn't understand what he was saying before, he says, come here, come here. He says, listen, brothers, didn't God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith? He said, what? The, the poor? You! Didn't he choose you? Didn't he choose us, the children, the poor in the world, to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? <laughs> God, God didn't just come because there was something inherently good about Israel. He, he didn't choose them because they were a great nation. He, he chose them because they were not. They were the opposite of that. And if you've read much of the Old Testament, you know they, man, they miss it, missed the mark so many times. Even in the New Testament, they, they continuously miss the mark. Even his disciples, man, who are walking with him, they miss the mark. And even uh, God's word tells us that uh, there were Greeks who had all kinds of wisdom. There were people who were aristocratic, um, came from, man, uh, great family lines. But their wisdom, their earthly and worldly wisdom did not allow them to accept what God was doing. Jesus came and walked among them, and their worldly wisdom didn't allow them to receive what God was doing. Because he didn't come like many were expecting him to come. He didn't come like a conquering king. He came lowly, born in a manger, <laughs> born uh, to a carpenter, and to a young maiden, a young virgin. He, he didn't come the way that you would expect a king to come. He came poor and lowly. He came meek and mild. And so James is trying to help his Jewish brethren and believers in general to understand that this is godly, that this is modeling how God uh, has treated us. He says, listen, God chose the poor 
to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. He says, verse 6, but you have dishonored the poor man. He says, just, just, just think, is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? It, it's amazing how uh, the one who gives you a hard time, this is who you are trying to show partiality to. The person who mistreats you, the person who drags your name through the mud, the person who makes your life difficult, this is who you're trying to impress? Really? He said, no, don't, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. He said, do, do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? They, they not only uh, mistreat you, but they disregard your faith in God. They disregard your faith in Christ. They, they, they discredit, they, they blaspheme the name by which you're called. So, so why try to in, impress them? Don't, don't do that. Verse 8 says, if, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. And so the question then become, how well am I doing in comparison to other folk? The question does not become, um, how well am I doing based on the world's standards? James says, if you are fulfilling the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself because every good believing Jew knew this verse. This, this, this didn't just show up in, in the New Testament. It shows up in the Old Testament as well. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And if you do that, you're doing well. Preacher, what does that mean? Nobody would be partial to themselves. Nobody would mistreat. Nobody um, would normally mistreat themselves and if somebody mistreating is mistreating themselves that's not normal right that there's something wrong there so he says don't show partiality but if you love it you're loving your neighbor as yourself you're doing well but then he says because sometimes people don't think racism is sin verse 9 says James is he, he, he helps us man he says if you show partiality you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors so it's not just in 2020 that racism became a sin racism has always been a sin because it, it's the sin of showing partiality. And not just race, but that's one of the biggest things we wrestle with, right? But then the church has been pretty bad with gender stuff too. Amen, lights. Yeah, we've been we've we've shown partiality there too. Now now there are there 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 are places in the Bible where it gives clear uh, instructions in terms of headship and leadership uh, within a household, right? Like, like there, God has a design, right? God has a preference, and God did not keep it hidden from us. He, he, it's in his book, and we can read it, right? And so he has a preference. He has a preferred way that things ought to go, and um, because we have free will, we have, man, sometimes veer off of the path that God has designed um, for us. Um, but wherever we have shown partiality, wherever we have judged with wicked motives, James helps us to understand that you, my brother, you, my sister, are committing sin. Amen. If you're preferring men over women, James says you're committing sin. If you prefer women over men, you're committing sin. There's no competition. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're part of the Lord's body. Our, our right hand is not competing with our left hand. They're working to support each other. 
That's how God desire, desires and designed his body uh, to function. We'll, we'll stop there and we'll pick up next week. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, and I pray uh, that you'll do what James says. You know, do what, don't, don't do what the preacher says. Just do what the word says. Uh, look at it intently and then be a doer of it. Uh, amen. You, you may forget what the preacher said, but you can, crack open, you can crack open your Bible. You can open your Bible and you can read what God's word says. And it is, contrary to popular belief, uh, a law of liberty, a law of liberation. Uh, would you pray with us, uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you again uh, for this time of sharpening, of uh, clarifying, and uh, helping us to understand uh, there are uh, ways you've called us to live. And Father, we pray that you would help us to get it right, that this is not just an educational exercise, uh, but we really intend to look at your word intently so we can be better doers of your word. Not doers to be saved, but doers because we have been saved already. Father, we pray that someone watching tonight who's unsaved, that you would save them, that you'd help them to know that uh, salvation is not earned, uh, but it is a gift. They don't have to be good enough. We thank you, God, that your word declares uh, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, uh, who was without sin, to live and walk uh, on earth and to go to the cross and to die in our place. The sin of the whole world was placed on Jesus, and he was judged for the sins of the whole world. Father, we thank you that your word helps us to understand that he didn't stay dead. He got up with all power in his hands, signifying uh, that his death in our place was sufficient. Father, for the unbeliever, would you help them to understand uh, that uh, what shows up in Romans 10 is correct, uh, that you would help them to make a faith confession, that they would uh, confess Jesus Christ as Lord with their mouth and believe in their heart that God has raised him from the dead, and your word declares that they shall be saved. Father, it, it, it's our desire that somebody would be saved uh, as they watch this, God. Somebody would make a faith confession. And, Father, we pray that the body would be strengthened, God, that those who are already saved, uh, that we would do better, that we won't be like the person that looks at themselves in the mirror and then walks away without correcting what we see. Father, help us to be better doers. Father, we continue to pray for families and individuals and um, our community, God, that you would help us uh, not to look inward and turn to ourselves, but to look up at you. Father, we pray that you would continue to meet the needs of your people, that you would continue to strengthen the sick among us, that you would continue to comfort and strengthen uh, families in doing bereavement. And Father, we pray that contrary to uh, what others may be feeling or thinking, that Jesus really is the reason for the season. So Father, we pray that during this season you'd help us not get caught up in uh, <laughs> the runnings of the world, uh, but you would help us to rest uh, in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. We thank you. We bless your name. Have your way. You be glorified. Help us to be better. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And every heart said amen. Amen. God bless you.